guys, what's going on? You are listening to The Prototype, and I'm one of your hosts, Mike the Birdman Dodd, but I'm not alone as we trek through Shibuya. Perhaps we'll take a stop off in Kichijoji. I'm pretty sure I pronounced that right, though I'm not entirely sure. And we are going to be talking about something rather special today, and we're going to be doing kind of a throwback to old school twig. We're doing a roundtable today. We're going to be talking about one of Sega and Atlas's latest releases, and that is Persona 5 Royal. Uh, however, I am not alone with my own version of the Phantom Thieves, though I would imagine we are significantly less uh, skilled than they are. I am joined by the man in Kitchener himself. Uh, Alex, the producer, who for some reason had his voice cracked just now, like I'm 12. I'm Alex. <laughs> And we are joined by a friend of the show, a longtime uh, listener, and he's become a friend over the past couple of years. And we are welcoming Ken Lutz to the show. Glad to be here, guys. Um, kind of surreal. <laughs> yeah, kind of surreal. Well, I, I know anime games and this sort of thing is your bag. So I figured what better time to invite an expert onto our show. Plus, I know you and Alex had a crossover of sorts uh, a couple of months ago. And um, I figure, hey, man, you're well-spoken. You're fun to play with whenever we get a chance to play RPGs together. So um, if I'm inviting you on my podcast, it means I trust you with my precious, precious baby. Um, and this is where he drops a whole bunch of F-bombs and a whole bunch of anti-Semitic <laughs> stuff just to piss no, you off, right? No. <laughs> no, no, just me. Nah, oh, okay, no. all right. Not, not <laughs> so, so yes, guys. As I mentioned, we are going to be talking about Persona Five Royal. So, before we go any further into our roundtable discussion, we have to get a few things out of the way, sort of housekeeping for this. So, uh, we have already covered Persona Five Royal extensively a few weeks ago with Alex. However, I was provided with a influencer uh, code uh, about a week or t- actually about two or three weeks later than Alex. I've just finished my playthrough about a week ago. Um, I put 150 hours into the game. Um, and this roundtable will include multiple spoilers. You have been warned now. We will be talking about major plot points, uh, some changes from the game, and basically everything that we feel makes Persona 5 Royal an exceptional game, some things we like, some things we didn't like, and why you should or shouldn't pick it up. But we're also just going to talk more general about the themes, the philosophies, and everything else that made up the Persona 5 universe for us, such as it may be. Um, that being said, hopefully you will enjoy this roundtable, as we do have something special for you, as you heard i had a little bit of fun creating uh the intro for uh this uh episode so it was fun uh but we also have a special interview later on in the show in probably about 15 minutes or so we're going to be talking with voice actor kyle a bear who was the voice of madarame who was the ruler of the second palace and basically helps you get the character of yusuke uh, in your party and uh, that was a fun little 15 minute interview we did with Kyle about the voice acting process because this is the second time he's recorded this game because their game originally came out in 2017 and then the re-release which just came out a couple of weeks ago he got back into the booth to re-record so that being said let's kind of go around the table and talk about everybody's experiences so um just to give you guys a couple a uh, couple moments to compose yourselves, um, going through my uh, playthrough of Persona Five Royal and Persona Five itself. In the original playthrough, um, I put 120 hours into it, um, which I picked it up on a on a PlayStation Network sale. Um, I think it was last April or something like that. And it was actually, Al- I think in August. No, it was in April because it just came up in was in it? my memories. On oh Facebook. no, no, I'm thinking of the dancing game. Yeah, it was like so, right. It was also like a couple months before. I think it hit on. It got moved over to the PlayStation hits at it, twenty bucks. Yeah, so I was like, you know what, twenty five bucks, I'm not bad. And Alex pitched it to me, and he pitched it to me in the silliest way possible. He's like, well, your best friend is a talking cat who turns into a car. And I was like, okay. Um, And then I looked at a trailer for it. And then he said, you know what? If you want to play the game on stupid easy, you can. You're going to get a really cool story. The gameplay is fun and fantastic. 
but you don't need to grind like old school Final Fantasies. It's, it doesn't have to feel like a JRPG if you don't want it to. So I was like, okay, sure. And during that time, I was kind of having a bit of a depressive moment in my uh, life and it was a wonderful distraction over the course of 120 hours and it was an emotional roller coaster to say um, the very least and I was remarkably pleased that I did do my uh, playthrough of it like I said uh, finishing out at about 120 something hours and then doing Persona 5 Royal uh, I got my review copy on March 22nd the game launched on March 30th um, I put a hundred and I think 57 hours in and I made different choices from the original uh, Persona 5 game. And in the first time I romanced on who is the uh, model in the game and I think is the I think is considered I, I don't know don't know whether she's the canon romance. But there's not really a there is canon. no canon romance. It, there is no well, canon romance, but it is it is the one they they generally at least from my experience with playing four just briefly, they do have a character that they make easier for you to ease into the relationship with. Yeah, it's, it's like just, the yeah. natural progression yeah. would be if you don't want to go after somebody else, it's very easy to get her. Mm -hmm. Um, I went after her because she's a model and why not? Plus she was the first person besides Ryuji who kind of opened up to you and you have the most history with. So it made the most sense in my head canon. Anyway, this time round, I made what I call a node, a, a decision run. And what do I mean by that is if I make a mistake in a relationship or I, or I choose not to romance somebody, I live with that choice. Now, I did put out a poll on my Facebook, who should I romance? I really wanted to romance uh, Futaba because I really enjoy her like character arc and her story. Should I go after Kasumi because she's the new character and not a lot of people, at least in our circle of friends, had romanced her yet? Or should I go the bro code and just handle this solo? Because not everybody at that age is necessarily ready to date. They're dealing with their own sort of stuff in life whatever i chose um by mistake uh to do the bro code and what i mean by that is i was distracted on my phone when i was doing the romance option for kasumi and where it says i should choose my words carefully here and i was like yeah 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 whatever and i found something on reddit and i got distracted for just a moment and i was like shit but i'm like nope I'm not going to reload that save because that means I'd have to replay the next two hours. So you know what? I'm going to live with it. And I saw a scene that I'd never seen before. I saw um, Morgana make fun of Ryuji on Valentine's Day. That was totally worth it. Um, although I did eventually uh, en ended up seeing the scenes on YouTube, which I'm really going to do another playthrough and do it right this time because it's not a real – it doesn't count in my mind if you haven't played it. So there it is. Um, and then, yeah, so that was my experiences with the first two alliterations of this game. So I guess Alex will go to you next. Uh, okay. So I, I loved the fourth game. It was the reason I picked up my uh, Vita when I went back to college because I saw somebody praising its, uh, uh, its, you know, praises because somebody had imported it that was in my class. Um, and I was like, okay, so when's this come out? And they're like, oh, you know, whatever date. And I went, okay, I had, like, I was poor as dirt <laughs> going back to school. But I was like, you know what? Maybe I can put aside some of these. I actually, basically, I bought used textbooks. And, and with the money I saved off of buying the new textbooks, I bought a Vita and that game. And that got me through the first semester of school <laughs> really good. Uh, and then I went, okay, uh, you know, when's the next one coming out? And little did I know I had to wait years. But then I picked up uh, the pre-order of Persona 5, loved it, played 10 hours, was like, I got to let this last. Uh, I played the first Palace, and I was like, this is really good. I, I, you know, I, gotta, I, I don't want to rush through this because I know I'm going to do basically what I ended up doing with Final Fantasy 7 and, and play like three days straight and, and then kill myself over it. <laughs> uh, and then I was like, no. No, okay, I'll let it last. And then it sat on my shelf for like ever. 
And when I was ready to finally go back and like, go, okay, fine. I'm, I've got no other games to play. I got nothing for review. I'm going to actually go and just play this and enjoy it. They announced that Royals coming out. And I went, well, I'm just, I'm just not going to play that now because, you know, I, you know, if I already waited three years or two years, I can wait another three months for the game to come out. <laughs> uh, and then I, I went and got the, uh, I, I put in a request for a review copy uh, on the 24th of February. And I received a response on the 5th and got a copy of the game. That's about a month early. Um, I believe I was part of the first wave of review uh, codes because they seem to do it in two ways. As you know, you, Michael, you and I compared, um, when you get a review copy, there's different instructions you get on what you can and can't do, what you can and can't show. Mm-hmm. And um, mine was... Uh, Mine was fairly restrictive in that, you know, it's like, don't show this part of the game. Don't show this part of the game. Don't show this. Yours was different. Yours was just like, show anything. Because you got your code, uh, I think, four days or five days before release. Mm-hmm. Yes. You, you got yours on what, like a Saturday, and then it was out on Tuesday or something, right? Yeah. I got mine like four and a half weeks early, or four weeks early at least. Which is which is typically unheard of because there are the only games in my career I had a month early in terms of um, review code availability that I can really remember is I had Halo Reach fairly early, I had Mass Effect two and three pretty early, and Skyrim and maybe Fallout four. Yeah, like you, you figure RPGs, you get generally because I've reviewed a lot of RPGs for here, I I will get them two weeks before they come out. That's the standard. Uh, they give you because they figure, okay, this game is like forty to eighty hours to beat. You know, if you're if this is the only game you're reviewing, it's still going to be minimum three hours a day <laughs> that you got to go through to to get there. But you know, for whatever reason, I got it. You know, the fifth, I believe it was that I that I got the code and I started playing it on the sixth, and I was done by the tenth, maybe tenth or twelfth, something like that. So I was done like almost a month before everybody else even got a chance to play it. Uh, and, and it was, it was interesting to me, like seeing that the, the review embargo went up, I think a week before release. And when I started seeing reviews pop up, cause I, you know, I had completed the game, but I didn't have the game review ready for launch until that weekend. But I remember thinking, see, reading them going, I don't know how many people actually played as far as I did because they're saying that there's some changes to the game, but that it's, you know, it's like, oh, it's just little things here and there. And it's, you know, I don't know if it justifies the full, you know, 60 American, 80 Canadian price point. And I'm thinking, what are you people talking about? This is like almost a completely different game. Yeah. Like, uh, and I, I mean, like, I, and I'd only played 10 hours into the original. And even with only the 10 hours into the original, I could tell the difference. I ended up re-downloading my original copy of the game, which I don't believe you can purchase anymore from the PlayStation Network. No, you can. It, it's you can, it's yeah. just because they, uh, think, is it buried they moved in there? it over to the they moved it over to PlayStation Hits. So oh, okay, because when, when, when I did a search for it, you know, I can find it in my um, in mine, but I couldn't find it when I was typing it in on a different account. So I don't know, whatever. But I I installed it, and I'm like, okay, well, it's the new game is twice the size. It's, it's literally twice the, the file size. Uh, the textures and everything, it seemed different, which we can get into the details there. But as far as like the first 10 hours of the game, to me, I'm like, this is very different than I remember. So I don't know how far people were getting when they were releasing their reviews initially, but I feel like some people might have, you know, I won't throw anybody in particular in the bus. It seems like they skimmed through without actually playing the game. <laughs> Uh, and then, well, there you know, were a lot of preview. Uh, a lot of the bigger outlets got to do the preview stuff, yeah. and that showed said, select stuff that was which, new, which which was fine. Uh, but then, I, I some of the initial reviews that came out with the first wave, like mine, they were not as thorough as I, I would say is probably the best term I can give. Uh, and then, when the second wave of reviewer codes, which I believe Michael's was considered an influencer code. Yes. Because because mine talked about having the review embargo and yours said uh, a streaming embargo. So, sure. <laughs> uh, but when yours came out, like when your review, when you were playing and you finished fairly early because you, you had a few days, on, well, four or five days ahead of everybody else anyway, um, and you were done, that's when all the reviews started coming in saying, hey, it's, a, it's like a dramatic change. And I'm like, uh-huh. 
So I felt like when I was reviewing it, like I, it was so hard not to share information. I was like, oh, I want to, I want to talk about this, but I really can't spoil it for anybody. It's like, but I want to talk about it because the last third of the game that they added on to it was so dramatically different and, and had so many dynamic shifts to it that I, I didn't see any of that represented even hint to that in any of the reviews that came out initially in wave one, literally outside of us and maybe one other one that I saw. So I felt like people didn't make it to end game, but then realizing with me skipping through, not skipping, but like playing fast forward through the text, reading as fast as I can when I was playing, uh, I still put in 75 hours on easy <laughs> to get through the story. So I'm thinking, okay, so this might be a case of, People wanted their reviews out to be timely, but they didn't actually get to the end game content until a hundred hours in. Yeah, and I, I'm like personally, I ha- my work with Persona. I've played gold. I played gold in a little bit. I actually, literally, the first thing I did, did when I bought my Vita was buy a copy of Golden because, yeah, that's the one thing you buy for your vita <laughs> it, it should be it's basically like uh mandatory like, yeah it, it's like it's like getting mario that should have been the pack and title i mean it pretty <laughs> much was it's the only thing that moved sales in the west and moved sales in japan for a while yeah well the vita is also like light novel central for everyone that likes light novels anyway but uh i did play five uh, i i actually had to put in the put in my copy of 5 and look at it again for my completion time and I I went in over 172 hours into the original P5 and it I widely consider it one of the greatest game experiences I've ever had uh I've I can only I I can only have I only have like a few real highlight game experiences um and Persona 5 was definitely one of them and Royal is definitely one of them as well cuz you I was just blown away going through that at, at and giving uh, given that I spent 100 hours into the game and that doesn't count the good six seven hours of me just playing uh playing the mini game of uh tycoon (laughs) hell just just yesterday i i popped on the ps4 and just played tycoon for another half hour 45 minutes and yeah i i really adore (laughs) i i i adore this game and i adore persona in general um it's just a really great franchise yeah persona was probably one of the gaming experiences i am willing no i i i i I can probably say persona 5 royal is probably in the top five games of all time for me it's definitely one of the best games on the playstation 4 right now Um, I think it is absolutely a reason to own a PlayStation 4. It's definitely one of the last, it's going to be one of the best last games of its console generation. I think it's one of the greatest JRPGs of all time. I I really think that. Um, It did everything it needed to. It had fantastic characters. It told a compelling story. Um, It mired together all these game systems of uh, combat, social simulator, distractions like billiards and darts but whatever um romance and it all tied it together in a fairly comprehensive package it also had spin-off titles i think the dancing one's called dancing in moonlight um which is available on psn right now for sale i think for the next week or so um at a reduced price um and it's been a pop culture phenomenon because i know there's persona concerts in japan all the time which is amazing um going through the story with persona was something i didn't quite expect um it was an emotional journey 
uh, for me going through it. Um, as, as I mentioned, I was going through this game in a fairly depressing part in my life. And um, I, I've made no secret of it and I've shared it for several years, but I suffer from um, severe depression and bipolar too. So I have my share of mental illnesses, though I am well medicated, though Alex can attest when Mike is down, Mike is down hard. Um, and, playing yeah, and, for- and, and and unlike somebody who's like, oh, I'm having a down day, it's a chemical imbalance. You can't control that. So when you're down, you are down, down. Yeah. Like it's it, like, it's legitimately hard to find things that make me enjoy my time. And persona brought out something in me. I didn't quite expect because like, for those of you that don't necessarily know, Persona is the story of outcasts. Uh, Persona 5 in particular is the story of, uh, of an outcast and people who are, they're different from everybody else. The protagonist, Joker, um, is uh, basically accused of a crime he didn't commit, is uh, sued by this guy and is sent to live in the city by his parents to live with a guardian for a year, go to a upper... Uh, trying to think a more prestigious uh, kind of boarding type school, uh, Shujin Academy, and be on good behavior for a year, then you can come home. Don't cause any trouble. And he meets other misfits, other outsiders. And through that together, you see relationships start to form. And I think I saw a little bit of myself in there because as most games, when you play the role of the silent protagonist although he's not really silent he does talk every so often like not a whole hell of a lot a lot of grunting and yelling persona um that's so fun but that's okay um i found just a lot of the characters resonate with me like ryuji the rebel who kind of doesn't know where he belongs he made a terrible mistake he he stood up to the wrong authority figure and ended up getting his knee busted for it or on who, because she's pretty and people expect certain things of her rumors start floating around. And she only does what she does to look after her friend, Shiho and Makoto, who's just, you're expected to get good grades. You're expected to behave. This is your life path laid out for you. Just, just deal with it. Haru. Um, it's an arranged marriage and it'll look good for the company because daddy says so. And you don't really have a kind of say in this. Futaba is a character that really, really resonated with me because I see this shut-in outsider who blames herself for her mother's death, um, who has all this mental trauma of not being around people. The only time she ever reached out to a friend, um, that person ran away because they had a fight at one point. Um, and then I'm trying to think, who, who else am I missing here? Uh, you have, uh, Yusuke. Yeah. Uh, the artist who was adopted by a master who took advantage of him and he is a struggling artist looking for his voice in the world. And he feels like he's stymied by all the problems that he has going on. I mean, he's still, trying to paint but it doesn't feel as authentic and genuine to him as it used to he's looking for his voice yet again and then um with this one we do get to play as a catchy more more so than we did in the original uh plus we get him as a confidant this time which fleshes out his story wonderfully too he in the original game he was just this detective prodigy and he was overly cheerful but you always knew he was watching you he was sort of the antithesis to the phantom thieves and he wasn't a dick bag for being a dick bag but you knew at the end of the day he had it out for you and then you get kasumi who's this wonderfully sweet girl who keeps head who keeps hitting on you and calls you senpai and it was hard not to fall in love with her and to share a personal story um, for just a moment, uh, Kasumi reminded me a lot of a girl I dated in high school who shall remain nameless in just how they approached me, just how the relationship kind of played out. And it was a lot of memories came back and 
when you saw the romance scene, which I'm really wishing I didn't fuck this up because seeing it play out on YouTube was something else. Cause this was something that I saw kind of play out in my own life too. Um, it was, it was sweet. It was special. And I think it tapped into very much the high school dating better than anything I've ever seen portrayed in most media. I mean, I don't even think some movies get this right. It felt like that teenage awkward romance and Joker isn't exactly a ladies man. Even when you get his, his social skills maxed out, he still isn't super clever. Like sometimes when you're picking the different responses, they're like, okay, that's a little funny or it's it's a little weird. Um, But watching those two come together either as friends or as romantic partners, was something kind of special. I mean, the first time I romanced on, I just thought she was pretty. I thought she was a well-drawn character, but I also thought she was a good character in and of itself. Futaba, I liked because I saw a broken person, but one I wanted to save. And that's, as Alex can attest to me in my personal life, I'm always attracting what he calls broken people, but that's not that's <laughs> not a bad thing. You're making me yeah. sound bad saying that, but you, no. What, what I what I mean was like we were talking about how uh, it's not that you attract broken people. You're, you're not like a predator or something. You're no, more no, like, no. You're like you're like I want to help people. It's I think how I refer to it is it's like you want to help people, and I said it's like it's like this week in gig is like a carnival. Sometimes we pull in people that need help that are down in their luck and, you know, raise them back up again. Yeah. Sort exactly. of the idea. Yeah. And I saw that in her is that I wanted to help this person come out of their shell. I wanted them to like in the game and how I felt playing as the protagonist, I wanted to show them a world beyond four walls. And when I didn't, when it was really hard to choose that romance, do I romance for Tob or do I not? I'm like, no, she can stand on her own two feet. She's been showing this. And like I said, with Kasumi, it was so hard not to think back to high school, back when I was um, between between the ages of 14 and 16 years old, where I uh, dated a few different girls. But she really reminded me a lot of my first serious girlfriend. Um, and it was, like I said, it was a nice rush of memories, a lot of memories I didn't expect, a lot of emotions I didn't expect um, to come back up. And there's just some tender moments in their character arc that really come together that I really didn't expect. And I was really, really happy that it did. Um, So that was sort of the emotional journey um, for me going through this. Um, Plus seeing everybody else come out as their own but we'll talk about that a little bit more so let's go back to alex what was your emotional experience and then we'll go to ken and then we'll probably break for our interview with kyle i it was weird i I was put into like the zone is probably the easiest way to say it like when i was playing i was playing for like 10 12 hours a day (laughs) so I, i would sit there and i was sort of transported into it you know the world itself i was not affected uh in that like i didn't see any of my real life experiences in the game but i felt like i was still a part of the world overall uh i i was probably more affected by the concepts uh both uh like scientific and and philosophical in the game than anything we and i know we'll talk about that later on but uh, I found this to be, you know, even more so, you know, than a Final Fantasy game. It's like, oh, it's sacrilege saying that, but uh, I found this to be the most real, fully realized world in a Japanese game. The, they're usually really good at giving uh, a quick, easy narrative story, and they usually follow the, the standard anime tropes. But this felt like they took the best aspects of of Japanese. Uh, game design philosophy and merged it with the best of western rpg philosophy and in uh in the west it's all about the lore and and the world building and in the east a lot of times it's about a strict narrative story and they found a way to put both in this and that's sort of just my personal take on it yeah i 
again, like looking through my notes that I just like jotted down, I'm just like a lot of times I, when it comes to characters and performance, I usually get like ASMR level chills. And uh, there was a lot of that in both the original and with Royal. And I, I, again, like um, there was a moment in the third semester that I legit started crying. <laughs> like 100%. I legit started crying and I was floored. <laughs> I I was like, damn, <laughs> I'm actually crying at this. And it, it, and it was one of those weird moments where it's just like, Oh God, my heart's breaking. <laughs> One of the things I didn't expect out of Royal is they made me care about um, a catchy who becomes a full confidant in this and does join your party at two separate parts in this. And when you get him in the third semester, he makes you a deal. He's like, we're both going to fight back against um, Maruki. And if you haven't guessed, we've already mentioned spoiler folks. You've come this far too friggin' bad. Um, but he says, I'm going to do this with or without your help. I will not be pitied. I will fight back. I will take back what's mine, no matter what it costs. And I really like that about him. And to me, Goro was Ori was always kind of, he was an okay character, but Royal really fleshed him out. Well, like in playing it, like because again, I I was playing it for the first time. I didn't know how the game ended initially. You know, I I mm, played to where yeah. I figured I'm like so, I think I know where the so ending the whole is. pancakes the pancake sequence was a yeah. I, yeah. I, so that I, jaw dropped me the first time. And yeah, I was so like, like I, I didn't get that. Like there were ugh. there were aspects in Golden that were similar. Where I was like, what? Like for anybody that, that, that I didn't realize that there was a you know, extra characters and stuff and go, I didn't know golden was so, you know, different or had things changed and had, you know, different endings. But when I played the, that game, I ended up getting the true ending the first time I played it. Uh, and the, the revelation of who the real, not just the, the main bad guy for that, but when you find the true ending, when you realize the, the revelation of what, tr- uh, what entity or whatever it is made the whole game transpire, and you're like, wait, what? That's what started this? Um, and, I mean, Birdman, you'll go and play it eventually, right? What? Uh, Golden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So there, there. Uh, it's it's been out long enough. There is, uh, if you get the true ending, like, you know, there's always a secret extra boss in these true endings, right? Uh, how, I won't say what it is, but it's literally like, you're like, who's the boss? And it's something that you would never, ever, ever suspect. And it, this whole thing is instigated with a handshake. Mm-hmm. Like the the yeah. entire game, the all the horrible shit that happens transpires because of a handshake. Which you know, in in the lore of uh, you know, you like supernatural, like like the demon world. Us basically, you enter a contract without even knowing it. Oh, that's clever. And that's what that's what it, like it's literally something that happens in the first one minute of the game that is that has is so insignificant but that's what causes the whole game to happen yeah huh. and if you played the original version i don't know if that's in there and i if do you, not believe it is in, in the finished version like the in the golden version you beat the game you find out the murder mystery blah 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 and then that's it but if you've done everything right by getting your 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 confidence up to the max and you have a you entered a relationship, you did all the right events, you picked all the right answers for everything. Um, when it comes time to leave town, you're walking through and you're like, something's still wrong. Something You're like, something's itching me. And it's like, it's probably based on what fans wrote in about even. They're like, because you're like, well, what caused all this? Like, you know, because it's always about the gods of this and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you don't actually get that moment in the game until then you're walking out and you're like, wait, what did cause all this? And you're like, wait a minute. And then you start to, you, you go through like a flashback and you're like, wait. And then you, it's it, the reveal is like, holy shit, really? And it's it's not like it comes out of nowhere. 
if you had been paying it like now after you've seen it when you play the game a second time you're like oh i can see why that happened but then it leads into the final palace or final dungeon and, and it was pretty cool but i remember playing that and going oh shit well this you know game has that oh shit moment where i was playing and you know i, I beat it got to where i got to go and i made all the right choices uh, I luckily, sorry, raised all the confidant levels as high as I could, made sure I got to level 10 with uh, the new characters, because I was like, I'm assuming that's going to be something similar to what happened in the first one, or when I played gold, that you want to have that up. And then I'm seeing, you know, I'm asking questions about the game, and people are talking to me in, in uh, Discord and other, other areas that are friends are contacting me. And uh, I'm like, so, you know, this happens, this happens. Oh, they're like, oh, and, you know, do this. And I'm like, okay, well, the big change for me was make sure that you get those confidence up, uh, confidants up in the, the new characters, like the guidance counselor, because in playing it, I was like, I wanted to get the level up because it opened insight into the, who the characters are, because you get to see a little more, you get to see like real world psychology and psychologist, uh, yeah, um, it's applied to bonkers. it. You get to, you get to literally see what, like they delve in, they must've had consultants on it that yeah. sort of delved into what the psyche of a person like that would be. So you get to learn about your characters more than you've ever done before. I, kn- I knew that wasn't going to be part of the original game because it seemed a little out of place initially until the reveal of, of him being the bad guy. You're like, oh, the reason he's... He, he, the reason... Not, no, not the reason that he's a bad guy, but the reason the world is basically so perfect, you know, in the, in the post-game where, you know, uh, you, the delusion that you're living in is so perfect is he literally used his psychology major to get into your head, understand what made you tick and tried to make a perfect blissful world for you. So yeah. he's, he's legit. And I love the idea of a bad guy, the true bad guy, not being evil, legitimately not evil. He is actually a good person who's made one simple mistake. And that is giving up or trying to take free will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, given, given the fact that his persona is based on a Cthulhu god. Yeah, that I thought was actually kind of awesome. Like Azathoth, like the god at the at the at the center of the universe. Azathoth, yes. <laughs> and then and then his the final evolution. I actually had I actually looked it up, and it's a reference to Adam, as in Adam the first man. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so, that I have no idea. So, yeah, I mean, is, given the yeah. given the fact that his palace has this very Garden of Eden feel to it. Well, yeah when, you, sense, when you, yeah, when you get to the top, his his idea is I, I want I want to make paradise for all. Like he legitimately thinks that what he's doing is actually good, which is why his world is so different than everybody else's. Everybody else's was for their own selfish gains. His is his entire world is uh Ultimately, it comes down to him wanting to control things, but he doesn't even realize that's what he wants. Uh, but he, it's he's like he doesn't even view himself as a god, even though that's what's how it's coming across. But he legitimately wants to make everybody feel happy. But it's like you must feel happy all the time because I don't. You shouldn't be allowed to think for yourself because if you think for yourself, you're allowed to think sad. Mm -hmm. So we are going to talk about this a little bit more. We're going to talk about the philosophy and sort of examining maybe our own experiences through the lens of Persona 5 Royal. But before we do that, we're going to take a little brief break here on the prototype only on thisworkinggeek.net and take a listen to an interview that I did with uh, Kyle Abair, who's the voice of Madarame, who is the palace ruler of Yusuke's... um, palace or second palace whatever um and yeah when we come back we're going to talk about all sorts of other things persona and even more so thank you for joining us here on this week in geek.net we'll be back guys right after this pardon me sir there's a matter we need to notify you about please excuse me for a moment what is it we found this outside a letter it's uh mm. sir ichiriusai matarame a great sinner of vanity whose talent has been exhausted. You are an artist who uses his authority to shamelessly steal the ideas of his pupils. We have decided to make you confess all your crimes with your own mouth. We will take your distorted desires without fail from the Phantom Thieves. 
Welcome back to this edition of The Prototype. I'm, of course, Mike the Birdman Dot. I've been joined with Alex. And as you've heard over the last little bit, we have been talking about Persona 5 Royal. And, well, I did want to get a little bit of a deeper insight into what goes into Persona 5. Uh, and I actually, turns out, I know one of the voice actors involved. And I've been friends with this guy for a number of years. We have collaborated a number of times in the past. He was actually one of the first interviews I ever did uh, for Twig back in the day. And one of the people I've just kept in my back pocket as I need some help. And he's almost always been there for me. I've hung out with him a number of times. And I'm talking about friend of the show, Kyle Abair. Uh, he plays Matarame in Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal. Without uh, further ado, Kyle, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's uh, it's great to be here. It's I think it's my very first interview over discord it's like this is interesting yeah it seems to be the method that a lot of podcasters are now using and thank god for this because i remember the first time we spoke was over skype it would have been getting on 10 years wow yeah we've known each other a decade hard to believe that's how much time has passed and obviously for you that's a lot of voice roles and a lot of times being the hero even villains and you die a lot i hear i do i die for a living i, I i've had <laughs> so many roles and most of them aren't aren't named <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of named roles, so I was doing uh, some research for my review of Persona 5 Royal, which we're talking about right now here on the prototype, and I found out that you voiced Matarame, and he plays the second uh, palace uh, villain who is sort of the antagonist for Yusuke, the second member of your party who shows up, who's the artist. And you came back to reprise the role in 2020 for Persona 5 Royal. So I guess what I'm asking you here as my first question to you, what was it like preparing for what I would consider a pretty substantial role in this game, setting up one of the new um, people who's going to be helping out the party? Basically, what takes, what does it take to prepare for a role because i've never been much of an actor myself do they just hand you the lines and say here read this what did your director do basically what does it take to perform a role well the process doesn't involve any prep uh usually going into a session would just require knowing the time and the studio of course uh now currently the the whole industry is adapting to people being able to record from home. And we're doing that we're with Skype and Zoom and a uh, program called Source Connect. So we can digitally connect studios and have broadcast quality audio and everything. And it's been a mad scramble between engineers, studios and actors, uh, you know, all freaking out going like, how much money am I going to have to drop just to make sure that, you know, my student, my home setup sounds as good enough to, so that they'll still hire me. Uh, <laughs> so that's been a little bit of a headache too, but, uh, so far so good. Um, got, I got to record on persona five, uh, this, this new one before all this madness went down, obviously, cause games take a long time to, to make and develop. Fortunately, there, there was no, um, there's no homework involved. Uh, I would get there, the director and the writers, people's from, people from the game company would be there uh, to kind of talk me through the, the, the finer points. And, uh, of course, they keep on, on file in the computer. They'll, they'll have a, a reference audio clip. It's like, this is what you sounded like. Okay, good. Play that. Pete and repeat. It's like, all right, we're in the mode. And uh, basically, your script is just a, a huge uh, Excel document with tons of columns and tons of tabs and every character is separated. Uh, of course you could display with Excel, you can show the script in context or extrapolate just each, ro each role by their own lines. I tend to see just my own lines, but sometimes when my character's asking a question or responding to someone, uh, the director will fill me in. Someone from the game company will, will be there to help help guide the director as well. Now, I didn't really know much about the, the Persona universe. I've played some, some, some characters through the years in the series, and uh, the anime of Persona 4 
Um, who was that? Mitsuo. He was a he was a creepy guy. Uh, <laughs> but Matarame, uh, they didn't have to tell me much other than you know what he, what his role was in the in the game. So. <clears throat> Kind of looking at that and reading your roles, you do play a relatively evil guy. I mean, just looking at his interactions with Yusuke taking advantage of someone who is an artist and stealing uh, their art, for lack of a better thing, and also basically killing his mom. Um, I guess because I know you mostly for playing heroic roles, what's it like to kind of cut loose and play a bad guy and Matarame being a special kind of scumbag. How does that feel? Uh, it always is like the, the meatiest thing that an actor can get into. They always say, Oh, I want to play the villain because villains are, tend to be the, the most polar opposite of, of people. Um, well, actors anyway, there's, there's a lot of evil people in the world, but, uh, <laughs> but to, to, uh, get to get to play in that uh, in that playground of course is uh that's that's a real blast to just to, to to just get away from anything resembling you as a person and the way you approach a situation and get into the meat and potatoes of someone else uh which is the allure of acting in general and of course, for me, doing voiceover, you know, we we get to get away from the bias of how one looks, and rely just on on pure acting and just one's voice to help uh, portray the thing. And you know, when we are recording video games, we don't get to see what the character looks like. I didn't see Madarame until I started signing autographs at conventions for the art book. That tends to be the the one thing that I've seen him in. He's not in any of the wall scrolls or the poster or, or any of the main merch out there but i see him and it's like wow he looks like a really thin version of me with hair it's like <laughs> i don't know if that was by design i was gonna say one of the things about Madarame is you're right he looks like a like like a different version of you like you're a pretty big um well not calling you fat or anything but you're a big dude right yeah, and yeah. Mater and Madarame is this very thin very regal man and yet your vocal performance, and I, and I mean this as a compliment, I didn't know that was you until I read about it because that's how much your role captivated me. Because like literally, like I said, this guy is a special kind of dirtbag, and it just kind of drew me in. So when you were when you came back to re-record lines for Persona Five Royal, was there any part in the script that really took you as? This is fantastic. I am going to ham this up as much as I possibly can. Basically, what was your Darth Vader moment? Um, it's really just a, a, a case of uh, being in the moments for each take and giving the director what they're looking for. Sometimes they'll say, hey, let's dial it back. In fact, more times often than not, you know, since we do listen to the Japanese audio before each take uh, to hear you know, how loud or soft or intense uh, something needs to be. Um, we'll, we'll use that as a guide. Uh, and then the director will be like, okay, let's, let's do something a little bit different than that. A lot of games now tend to move towards what they'll call like a cinematic feel, a more grounded, uh, realistic sort of thing. Now that may be more difficult to do with with <laughs> anime inspired things but um you know there is always a, an effort and i guess that that's uh that's a distinct difference between you know watching something in its original language versus an english adaptation of something uh so yeah that's that's really the only only uh thing i could uh, i could see is other than other than the fact that i'm coming back to this character we're going to hear, you know, some reference audio, the the person from the studio, you know, because I didn't play the previous games, will remind me who I was and, and where I am and, and what sort of territory are we revisiting and what new territory we're re revisiting. So uh, I think I was able to get this done in, 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 in like maybe one two hour session. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, maybe maybe two, maybe three tops. Uh, I had a I had a lot more booth time for Persona Five, the the first game. So yeah, I, I was actually just about to ask you that. What are the differences between when you originally uh, did this in 2017 to the re-record in 2019, or sorry, in t- in 2020? Yeah. Uh, well, I recorded. I want to say towards the end of uh, 2019. I want to say for this 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 new incarnation and probably about a year before persona five came out because man, uh, English adaptations for uh, Japanese games, of course, are just like, it takes forever. This goes back to me being on uh, street fighter and just having to sit on voicing Ryu for golly. It felt like a year before it finally dropped. So it's like, you know, you you sign NDAs and just like, okay, I can't talk about Fight Club, and then and then it finally drops, and then people figure it out. In fact, you know, I guess the, I guess a, a common thing for actors is like, oh, I didn't know it came out until someone will tag me on Twitter going, hey, great job, is so and so like, what? Oh, oh, that's that. Oh, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> First world problem. I've I've recorded so many things in twenty years. I can't keep it all straight. <laughs> but say so, yeah you I mean you've certainly had the most prolific career and you've always remained relatively humble i mean you've always stayed really close with a lot of your dragon ball fa- family from the flamboyancy of sean shamel because that man is a national treasure um <laughs> to the ridiculousness that as chris sabat and all those people i uh you've definitely been one of the more entertaining people I've had the pleasure of knowing over the years from the Dragon Ball family. And especially since you started doing street fighter, which is where you and I really started talking. Um, it's, it, it's been a, an absolute joy to kind of watch your career grow over the years and just watching, like I said, you die in a variety of different fashions, but you've had leading roles. Oh, over the years and it's always interesting to know what you're up to and i guess as my final question as we exit this interview um what are some of the projects people can look forward to hearing you in that you can talk about (laughs) what can i talk about geez uh let's see well i voiced fat gum in my hero academia but i think i'm done with his story arc for now hopefully he comes back I'm relying on fans to tell me because I don't read the manga, but <laughs> they'll say, oh, yeah, he's, he's got a big story arc, but uh, uh, not, not for a while. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I guess if Capone comes back in one piece, he, he, te- he seems to be here and there once or twice a year, and the, the fans are warning me, oh, yeah, he's got something big coming down the line. And obviously, if Dragon Ball Super will ever come back, I don't see why it wouldn't, but I haven't heard anything official. And uh, I've yet, of course, to record for for anything in the Dragon Ball vein. I guess the newest thing was, of course, already out there, Kak- Kakarot. Um, everything else is uh, kind of mum's the word, but uh, I'm always excited to, uh, to, to do this because it's like the coolest job in the world. I get to play and and get paid to do something that I'm I'm very passionate about, and especially now in these quarantine times, where it's going to be interesting to hear a product come out, whether it's a game or a show, knowing that every actor was, well, I mean, in all games and anime, actors record separately, but now knowing that they're recorded in every actor's home, <laughs> and then having to be mixed and sweetened and engineered and and perfected somehow to sound like as if it's all done in one place. I mean, it's definitely going to be interesting times for the industry kind of moving forward. Once again, Kyle, I got to thank you for taking time out of your exceptionally busy day to speak with us here on This Week in Geek. Oh, sure, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime. And I'm, I'm so grateful uh, to get to do this. I'm grateful for the fans. I'm a big geek myself. I, I love, I mean, I'm still stuck playing uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, uh, <laughs> the remaster. I'm still going in playing the, the uh, oh, what's the Fortnite version called? Warzone? Mm-hmm, yeah. It? It, yeah, I'm terrible at it, but uh, I love 
I, I love playing all this stuff, listening to podcasts and just delving into that. Well, we'll have to have you back on the show just to have a general geek conversation. So maybe uh, when your schedule uh, allows it, we'll just have a round table with Kyle. Oh yeah, man. There's so much time to binge watch and catch a lot of great things. I'm in love with devs on, on FX and, and Westworld on HBO and Woo, so many great things out there. We will have to talk after the show. All right, guys, that was my interview with Kyle Abair. So I'm going to throw things back to me and Alex as we continue discussing Persona 5 Royal. And, uh, well, our thoughts will be, well, hopefully finishing up soon after this. Now let's push forward. All right, we beat him. Welcome back to This Week in Geek.net. I'm still Mike the Birdman. I'm still joined with Alex and Ken. Big thanks to Kyle for doing that interview with us. So, all right, we've kind of talked about our experiences with the Persona series and our general playthroughs, but it's time to talk about some of the themes and philosophy uh, through these games. And as I mentioned during the intro there, I see this as a game that told the story of a lot of broken people finding themselves and persona five really, or persona five Royal specifically brought it laser focused when they introduced uh, Dr. Maruki and the idea of pain and sadness. And when he wanted to create that perfect world, um, some people were willing to give in to their deepest desires and just live in this perfect world where they, their mother is back from the dead in the case of Futaba with Makoto, her sister's happy. Her dad is still alive. Ryuji can run. Haru has her father back. She doesn't have the arranged marriage anymore. Um, Kasumi is an interesting case because she took on the role of, of Kasumi, Kasumi when her and... sister passed away trying to save her life. And yeah. it brought it into laser focus because in essence, Persona 5 is the story, in my opinion, your pain and the things from your past help define you, but they don't have to weigh you down. It's moving past forward and through it that makes you a better person. Like for for example, and this is the the personal message that I took away from playing through these games, and I felt really empowered doing so, is I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, both personally and professionally and even health-wise. Like when I lost my leg to amputation back in 2017, that mistake is on me. I did something I shouldn't have. I was very stupid. I lost my leg from diabetic complications ultimately, but I started that process. I did dumb. I accept that. But when I think about it, I look at how I've grown as a person. I look at how I've grown emotionally and even to a certain extent spiritually um, uh, as well. And if someone offered me the chance to, you know what? You can live your life perfectly without ha without sadness, without without pain again. Pain. I don't think I, I would take it because it's all these terrible experiences have led me to where I am. That personal growth is a part of me, and I like how Persona Five Royal tells you that basically. Terrible things happen. It's unavoidable in life. It's how you deal with it and accept it as a part of you that shapes you as who you can become. It's about possibility. It's about potential. Like Ryuji, for example, says, you know what? Uh, when he rejects Maruki's offer at the end of the game, he's like, you know what? I'm going to move away. I'm going to go to physio. I'm going to try to get into college. I'm going to try to run again. That's a huge deal for him. A guy who was just going to be a punk kid and change his life. That's a pretty big step for somebody. And um, Kasumi slash Sumiri to move out of the Kasumi persona she created for herself and in the shadow thereof wanted to live for herself and to make the spirit of Kasumi proud to be a gymnast on her own merits, to 
win the championship for her. And that's important. Um, on wanted to move on for Shiho, but part of realizing that she wanted to make other people pay for what had happened, you know, like there's just so many things that terrible things happen to us, but it's, if you let it hold you back, it can ruin you. If you don't move forward and if you don't grow, you stagnate your desires, you might say become distorted. And this game made me think a lot about, philosophical things about basically as Alex pointed out in the intro, Maruki's not a bad guy. He's his intention is well-meaning, but how he went about it was bad because he wants everybody who said to take away free will, to take away the concept of anything bad can happen to you, that you live in a state of ignorant bliss where just everything is fine. But without that pain to teach you a lesson, without that life experience, are you really living? And I yeah, think, uh, I mean, one of my personal philosophies and one of the quotes that I put literally in multiple locations, I actually put it at the end of every single email I send. Um, and it's oddly enough from a Disney cartoon, but like it kind of struck me and it's pain is an illusion an illusion that really, really hurts. And it's like, yeah, pain is going to be something that you're going to experience, but don't make it be more than just an illusion. Get through it. And that, and just like, oh, it's everything like I love about. And the best part about the ending is just it had an exp it had a moment where I'm just like, Oh, this is something you can only experience in a video game. And it just added to the emotional resonance of the moment. Uh, when you're down at the near the end, of, like in the climactic battle at the end of the climactic battle, you're down, you drop from the monocopter, <laughs> which, which was, was great, great, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that was a great moment. Uh, and you drop down from the monocopter, and Mark, and you start having a fist fight with Maruki on the palace that's falling apart. And it's just like only in a video game can I experience something like this and actually have emotional like resonance while doing these actions. And it was just like, Oh God, this is perfect. <laughs> well, there is also something about that scene too. We we're having the fist fight with Maruki just as the monocopter comes back to rescue you. If I remember right, Joker offers his hand up to yep. Maruki. He's like, you don't have to die. Come on. And he just kind of doesn't. But obviously he lives because he shows up later as a cab driver. Um, but <laughs> well, no, he no, he does. Basically, he's he he's given up, and we, as the protagonist, we grab him, and he's like, "Why are you doing this?" And the motocopter comes by to get us both, get both of you. Um, it just like fades to white. Mm -hmm. like and it, it, yeah it's just up in the air it it says something that the protagonists in this game they're not willing to give up on anybody even when a catchy on the ship stabs you in the back and he tries to kill you he tries to save you and when a catchy shuts the door to fight his other his cognitive version of himself um he the protagonists are like, we got to save him. How the hell can we do this? He's like, no, go. Like, but they were like, willing to stay behind. I was, I, and I, love, that, I was like, yeah. wait, no, that guy's a murderer. Let him die. Like that was, <laughs> uh, and I love, I love the added bonus of the bit of dialogue that goes back to the, uh, the level, I think it was level nine 
confidant situation where you actually did a slight battle with Akechi and he's just like, he throws his glove at you and he's just, and you can comment like, I'll, I'll be waiting. I ha- I'm going to keep the glove. And it's just like, oh, yeah. Well, that, yeah. Uh, and he, he just, and that wasn't, of... that was not in the original game. That was oh, okay. completely I was original. Say, so let, let's backtrack for anybody that's, that's played the game so far. Like as far as the original, the, in the original game, uh, you know, because I didn't get to the, the end of the original game initially, but let's just say how it ends. Basically you, uh, you know, you find out a catchy bad guy, he dies, uh, you end up, uh, now in the original game, do you end up fighting the, uh, the fake, uh, Igor? Yeah, you, you shoot the god in the head. That's the final boss. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so you fight the fake Igor, shoot the boss in the, or shoot the thing in the head. That's the end. Uh, and then you, you turn yourself in, mm-hmm. you turn yourself right? in and it basically skips forward to Valentine's uh, Day. Valentine's ish. Day ish and where you, you get released you get released and then um that's you you do your romance type thing and then everybody gets to say their goodbyes and you go right yeah, yeah and you, you drive off with the phantom thieves into the sunset essentially okay, okay so in playing it i because i didn't know that i'm playing it i remember somebody asking me in discord like so um you know how did because they're trying to figure out how the second or the new semester tied in and I received like a private message just asking, you know, don't spoil it in publicly, but what, you know, what happens here? Like, so how does it tie in? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, after you go to jail, I'm like, you don't go to jail. And I, that's all I said. And that person goes, oh my God, what do you mean you don't go to jail? I'm like, well, you don't go to jail because the catchy turns himself in. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I was like, oh, is that a spoiler? And they're like, yes, yes, he is dead 100% dead like as in dead dead i'm like no he turns himself in he does the time you stay out but you have to you know lay low and uh you know and then like, like then what happens i'm like well then you know when a catchy joins your party and he's like ah, no more tell me no more because <laughs> <laughs> and, and i was like okay because like he joins your party in, in the new version obviously the, this is where the timeline diverges this is where meraki's uh influence happens well so his his time the Maruki timeline actually starts diverging on starting Christmas. when he leaves. No, when he really? leaves yeah. the yeah. school, that's when the diver that's when it starts to slowly diverge. Okay. And you'll you'll notice very it, slowly. Uh how you yeah. notice it is you know how you have the wavy they change the graphics so there's that wavy sort of rainbow hue to the certain things. Mm-hmm. Um you know, in the in, in the weird wacky version of the world. Uh when he leaves, there is very faintly in the background one wave of that. So when mm. he when you greet him and, and you know basically say goodbye, wish you luck and everything, um, that you can actually see there. It's very faint. It's a very very small effect, but I did go back and check it. And from then on, certain major plot points. If you're somebody who played the original game and you really pay attention, you can actually see that sort of haze happen once or twice, and then it gets deeper and deeper as the game goes on to the very end. But you don't really notice it in full force until Akechi shows up uh, to turn himself in. See, to me, that wasn't a revelation. So I'm playing yeah. it, and I'm like, he shows up. I'm like, oh, he survived. Okay, I guess. Cool. And then it's like, and then to me, I was like, I just, I, I, I thought the new content started when, when Mona shows up as a dude. Oh, no. Yeah. That, in your bed. That, that took me by surprise. I was, I was like, who the fuck is this asshole? Because well, they, I, it described him they, as sultry boy. I'm like, in, what? In your, in yeah, your bed, I'm like, spoiled, oh, they went they spoiled LGBT. That in, <laughs> yeah, they spoiled that in some of the uh, promotional material. That Mona, that the, the moment where you wake up and Mona's in the be- bed with you. They spoiled that in some of the and promotional like, material. We probably shouldn't be sleeping in the same bed together. <laughs> <laughs> Naked. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like so I, I knew there, but I didn't realize that Akechi wasn't in anymore. I thought, okay, he just comes back because, you know, it's a standard anime trope that somebody survives if they don't die on screen. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize he was dead dead. Like, and that person that was messaging me was like, oh my god. 
And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm like, but that's not really the mind fuck. The real mind fuck was after that person was playing, ended up messaging me and said, said, wait, the counselor is the is the main bad guy. I'm like, yes, that's why I was saying in, in the group chats. Oh, I uh, you got you got to make sure you get your your stuff up as as much as you can because if you don't get to level ten with him, you don't get the end game. Actually, you, I've, you I've, I've, I think you only need to get it up to level eight or nine. But I had you him up to get. You need to get him up to nine before his leaving. before he leaves. Yes. Yeah. So and same with yeah, you, 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 you I had him up to, to me up to level five, I believe, before sometime yes. in December. Yes. Although, if I did have one complaint, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, I wish you had more time with her. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, the idea though. is you get time with her in January. Yeah, yeah, but but you only get to play with her in one palace. That kind of annoyed me. Well, that was, that, that would have forced an alteration significantly of the game. Yeah, beyond. yeah. Like you get to play I was with hoping her for like you get two seconds in the beginning of the game. You get to play with her when you finally get back to that point for two seconds. You get to play with her in that palace in the was it fall or winter before the end of the game. It, it's right. It's right after Maruki leaves. Yeah. And before you yeah. uh before you start infiltrating Sai's palace, I believe. Yeah. 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 So you get to you get to do that with her where she's and her character's badass. Um Yeah, she's like she, oh. and, and if I, I could have had her from the start, I would have, but obviously you can't. So and and like I I it would have almost been like cool if you could play as her instead. Uh okay. yeah, like her story what is was even funny. What was even funnier is like every time she was in a different outfit, I'm like, God damn it. Why is this outfit even cuter than the last one? Yeah. Th- well, like, yeah, they, they spent time specifically. Also, like, also there's her. one thing there, there's one thing that I want to point out. There's a bowler hat in her room during her third awakening. And I was like, I want her. I want to see her in that bowler hat, and I'm sad I don't get to see her in that bowler hat. <laughs> well, somebody will draw it. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, like I, one, I was, just, was going to briefly say, Michael. Uh, sorry, the I didn't realize. Like I didn't read into it deep enough, but that each of their personas. It's not just that the persona itself is a manifestation of their feelings. I didn't realize that their Phantom Thieves versions are who they are on the inside and the real world they're wearing their mask like batman sort of you know what i mean yeah. like it's the bruce mm-hmm. wayne thing i didn't realize that because i realized that joker in the is actually a pretty sinister dude in the actual uh like in palace in the palaces and, and mementos like like just even the way he did persona like he's very aggressive whereas oh yeah the, i thought that that's just like oh he's you know just standard anime type stuff but then the more i realized the more i look into it, i'm like no so in the real world he the reason he's so reserved, it's not a case of like a silent protagonist anime character. It's he literally hides that he is a violent person. Yeah. He's and, got, well, that's why he uses a knife that, well, yeah, that's yeah, a weapon of an assassin. He basically uses a machete to, mm-hmm. and, 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 and it also brings into account like a catchy, uh, what he's seen, sees in him and draws him. You, you look at him and you're like, Oh, Joker could be him. If for a couple different things happening in his childhood, yeah, and, and it, that it, was the it's idea. It's also just um, the fact that a lot of the it, persona has always been a lot about every single main character persona is based on something. Uh, when it comes to the Phantom Thieves, everyone is based on like thieves, actual real life thieves or tricksters. Um, as it were, and uh, Joker's is Arsene Lupin. Uh, Yusuke's is a very famous Japanese thief. Um, oh, so, right? so, so Arsene is like Lupin. Is that what you're saying? Like the Lupin uh, story? Yes. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. Um, um, like ha- uh, uh, Akechi's like Robin Zorro. Hood. Oh, no, sorry. Z- um, Zoro is... Ake- um, uh, Zoro's Mogana. Yeah. Ryuji uh, is Captain Kid. Which I think is uh, awesome, Mako- by the way. Makoto is Pope Joan. 
the the uh female the the quote unquote legendary female pope uh she became pope and she disguised herself as a man and became pope and then she was found out and burned at the stake ooh okay <laughs> uh and then who was the catchies uh a catchies is robin, robin hood yeah and then okay. his super persona is loki the god of tricksters yeah and then uh and then kasumi what about her uh kasumi is cinderella okay that makes sense uh putting on the persona of somebody different by wearing different clothes yeah yeah the glass slipper so to speak yeah 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 so um, uh and, and then you know i guess uh and with the evolved or, or awakened characters um santanel is sort of like eh, it's like a to me it was like it's like oh it's like all of them on steroids <laughs> uh but yeah like I, I did notice that but i didn't realize like it didn't dawn on me while i was playing that that their personalities were, were so like it's not like they were putting on an air it's like no that phantom like the world when they go in as phantom thieves that's who they truly are on the inside so uh kasumi's character becomes much more confident much more aggressive as well like it's, it sort of mirrors the main character which is probably why they're attracted to each other in the real world too uh and then akechi's holy crap when you get to have him like yes all, he, he was he when, he bad turns. Evil. when he when he turns and he's bad in the, in the main game i was like that's pretty cool i wasn't really 100 percent seeing it coming i was like oh pancakes i get it okay you know well the one was... thing the one thing about akechi that really benefits in royal is the re-recording of the voice because yes. oh my gosh, the English version of in original P five with a catchy that was my one gripe with the game, and and that's why I didn't get far enough in the game initially to see him. So that's what I had heard. Like so, we know now that they've re recorded a lot of the characters, if not almost all of them, and most of the dialogue. But seeing him, like I, I couldn't. You know, I've only played the new version, so I can only see him in that role. But when he comes back to your party, like he's not just like i love that he's he's a friend of yours in quotes but he's more evil than anybody else in the game yeah and like it to, also to, and to also he, his his moves was... are to, his moves are literally he'll scream murder like, everything murder everything or or tear him to shreds or i'm going you know i'm going to gut you alive uh yeah. his like the showtime attacks of his I are literally his. Are, are literally Joker coming in to do some cool, flashy, jumpy, um, you know, sleek ass moves, and his move is to run in as fast as he can and stab you and pull out your entrails. Yeah, yeah, and then also it resulted in one of my favorite. Di- it became my new favorite dialogue choice. It was just like just every day a catchy when yeah. <laughs> when is he always is he always like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, well, like when it's literally like if you were in a fight, like let's say you're part of a, a, a clique or a gang at school, and you're getting into a fight in high school or something, and you show up and it's like, oh great, oh he brought Jim with him, and Jim just goes, kill them all, screams at the top of his lungs and runs at people with two knives. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, don't bring him along unless you really want, want it to go down. And yeah, I catch you the murder hobo. Like beyond like. I have not seen somebody play that crazy in a game in a very long time. And you can tell like the voice actor gave us all. Oh yeah. Like th- yeah. the one thing I-, I liked about persona five's Royal, uh, the characterization of a catchy is even through his voice and his character arc, you see the determination in him and the not quite n- no fucks given, but there will be fucks given, but they will be on my terms and no one else's. Like yeah. that—that that is something I even, felt even in during life with. the, even during I I rewatched some of the Marky uh, boss fight at the end, and right before he st- he goes to fuse, Akechi's just like Akechi knows what the heck's going on and just starts firing at Maruki to stop him from merging with his persona, and he's he's just like. Am I the only one that understands what the fuck's going on? <laughs> well, and then that's the thing. You know, leading us, we've sort of gone, you know, around and, and talked back and forth. But the the ending here, like in the second game, you get in a catchy lives in this dream world, blah blah blah. Uh, and the final palace is 
probably one of the top three or four best representations of truly uh, philosophical thinking I've seen in the game ever. And I know there's going to be ones out there that I'm missing, but as far as what I've personally played, at least in a Japanese game, this might be the deepest they've gone uh, to be as real world. It's it's less fantasy and more reality or thought experiment. Like you show up and it's basically a clinic and it's, where it starts to me is like they they do the this, the reveal of who it is, but then it's when you take the personality test. I replayed that about seven or eight, seven or eight times, just to make I sure mean, you, I, I got it right. Perfect. Yeah, when you got to when uh, I was getting close to that, you did comment just like have an extra save, and I did, and I'm just like wow, that's a uh... because I wanted to see how every reaction would be because. Every, you basically go up each floor and you and you choose you know it's like go through door number one door number two door number three and depending on which one you choose you get different dialogue so there's one right answer in quotes but the right answer is not necessarily and it, for the most part is not what you would say in your own mind usually is the correct answer and even stuff where i was trying to figure out well what would he think is right sometimes i still got that wrong and then they I... explain why you got that wrong and yeah. want, or, or, and if you got it, and so basically getting it wrong means you have to go into a fight. Big deal. But getting it right, they give you an item, they give you more dialogue, and they start you start to break down and psychoanalyze Maruki himself. And there isn't like a trophy or anything for getting them all right, but you do get some extra items, but you get more dialogue and more insight into who he is. So that's why I kept resetting. And then I would fast forward the dialogue to get to where I was. So I ended up playing it about six times till I got it completely right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it was just I, the that entire dungeon was just amazing, and except I, that stupid light puzzle, I hated that. The, the final light puzzle, I went was cross-eyed so trying to figure it bad. out. <laughs> I, I, I just got to walk and no, through. It couldn't do it. Let let me say let me say the puzzle. The final puzzle was not a bad puzzle. It was just a level that none of the other puzzles in the game were giving you it, but, it was but did, it was did you notice that they hint, hint. yeah like there, there have been puzzles that were usually like fairly simple to figure out this was a classic late 90s sega saturn playstation one level puzzle this yes. is something you would have seen in uh like a wild arms a star ocean 2 uh a, a or like a a um you know a weird saturn game that sort of thing. it's the kind of puzzle you'd see where it's like you get basically you have your primary colors and then turning one of the lights on or off will open up pathways and close other pathways but then they add another element when you get to the last floor there to get to the last will seed which you know there's no point in talking about them right you know in, in detail basically they added extra items to the game that you could get that if you collect them all you merge them you get extra cool items that give you cool shit anyway cool uh but you then have to blend some of the colors to make secondary and tertiary colors that yeah. then open up other pathways and it becomes a spirally type maze. And I didn't want to have to write anything down. I know you did, but Oh yeah. I, I, I drew a I, damn picture. I was there for an hour and I'm, it's like four in the morning. I've been up for like, like 20 hours and I'm sitting there and, I, and laying in bed and I'm like, I, I'm not leaving. I'm not even going to go pee. I had to hold it in. I'm like, I'm not leaving till I get through this. And I mapped it out in my head and I was like, step by step by step looking at it. And I kept bringing up the full map, bringing up the full map and looking. And I finally got it. I'm like, yes. And then I was like, wait, I'm trapped. How do I get out of here? <laughs> and then, because here's the thing. If you don't want to get that seed, it is like, you only have to open, I think, two gateways. What, to go now, all you, the way up, now you see what's right. funny is with me getting the will seed was easy. It was getting out of that situation that confused the hell out of me. Well, yeah, because once you're in there, you then have to basically reset everything to default. And then the path, you basically can run up to the right and go all the way up. But to get yeah. to that, to do that, you basically have to reset everything. And once I did that, I was like, sweet, got it. And then I left and I went to talk to, uh, to Jose about it. But I didn't seem to get anything for doing those three there. I think you have to wait no, until you the post game. You have to wait till after. You have to wait till New Game Plus to get that. I already yeah. tried. I, w- I went and I I'm I I looked it up. Uh, I've also I also missed the there is uh 
I'm assuming neither of you guys got the final Showtime attack. No, I I, I didn't because I I mean I went through as fast. Tell as me I could. more. You I, before you, you do have that, to. I'll say this: there yeah. is a hint. Yeah. There is a hint at what the puzzles are going to be in that last uh, level. Oh and, yes, and one hundred percent. The hint is, as you collect the will seeds, uh, they they were color coded the, the whole time. RGB. Yeah. So every time, yeah. so not just on like the the doorways to get in there, but when you every look sing, at them, every single will seed is red, blue, and green. Yeah. So and it's hinted that 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 whole time that you're collecting them, you're like, why why would they do red, blue, green? There's no reason for that, but they don't do anything in these games for chance. Every single detail in these Persona games have a reason. So. I was like, well, is this going to come up later on? And I get to the RGB dungeon and I went, oh, fuck me. I know exactly <laughs> what this is for. And they're doing they're doing exactly. Oh, God. I'm like, man, they've just went full Grandia persona, uh, like one. They went full PS1 level of dungeon on me. Yeah, I, that I, I will admit that puzzle was just kind of like, wow, I was not expecting this challenge of a puzzle. Yeah, in it, it wasn't so esoteric that it was impossible. Or anything. It wasn't like stupid. Oh yeah, things, no. Like I, I was like, or anything. I was like, it was I just no a legitimate. I this. It was a legitimate logic puzzle that you could figure out if you understood color theory. Now, God help you for colorblind. In one form of colorblind oh. or the other, you are screwed. Oh because yeah, that that's they may, bad. They say when you're going to turn the switches, what color it is. The problem is right. once you turn them and it changes what open and closed, you can only know what open and closed by looking at the map, and it will show you what colors are up. So if you're yeah. colorblind, you can't do that without help or a guide. Yeah, that color bl- I, and and a lot of Japanese devs like aren't the best at accessibility, but yeah. <laughs> that that's an impossible task for anyone who's colorblind. Um so I guess let's kind of I, I would love to hear everybody's experiences. What did everybody take as a romance from this game and what did you take away from? I'll briefly just say it was on and it was an accident because I did the same thing you did, Mike. I was like, you just kind of went with it. Because remember, I was playing in fast forward mode and I went, no. And I went, oh, okay, well, maybe I can get somebody else. And I'm like, oh, no. It's just, I, I basically locked myself into hers. And then yeah. the game glitched. Now, I was playing before the day one patch. Mm. So I didn't get to see the romance. It, I got the trophy, it popped for it. And then when it came to February 4th, uh, you know, when it came to Valentine's Day, I got the uh, the every girl shows up and gives you a piece of chocolate one, uh, which is what you get if you have everybody level to level 10, uh, but, so, don't, but don't have a romance with any of them. Yeah, the friend. Yeah, the, 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 the true confidant friend one, but at where you're basically with Sojiro and Ryuji and they're like, oh, it, it, and, and Morgana like, it must suck to be, you know, to not have any girls or anything, but then realistically you actually have every girl interested in you because they're all giving you chocolate. But I didn't get the whole, I'm two timing anybody. So they didn't beat me up. Now there's, there's another thing. Uh, because I romanced one character, uh, this is a segment that you don't get in the original. And that is white day. You get- Which is equivalent to steak and a blow job day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> kind of. I was, like, yes. I was like a white white day we're venturing down a very dark territory you, you better not tell me this happens in alabama and it's all and it involves crosses burning or something basically basically it's the uh uh the way valentine's day works in japan um the female will give a gift to the male and then on white day it's the male's turn to reciprocate he gives oh i was gonna say something really bad here uh <laughs> Please don't. Uh, <laughs> can, can I, Michael? No. no I won't. <laughs> Vega, we love you. <laughs> but yeah, okay, that's that's interesting. It, it, it is interesting to me to see the different cultures involved in here because it is different than what we're used to. Like, it seems like I was surprised even Christmas was a thing because mm-hmm. it's not. Oh. It seems to me like they've absorbed, like their Christmas is very is the pure consumerism Christmas completely. Like there's no, yes. there is yes. no relation to any religion, but I've seen uh, after playing the game, I went and watched a bunch of videos of like, what is Christmas like in Japan? And it's like, Oh, they generally go to like their own temples. They have their own traditions based on what city they live in or what prefecture they're from. And then they do, you know, it's about 
food. It's more about food and and the consumerism aspect of it. And also, and also, it has a air of romance to it as well. Um, that yeah, it, yeah. Um, but yeah, also White Day. Um, Sojiro is like the best wingman you could ever have. Oh God, yeah. Oh my gosh, what he does on White Day is amazing. He's like, you know, it's White Day tomorrow, right? And and you're just like, ah, crap. <laughs> and he's like, all right, all right, don't worry, bro, I got you. Call this place. They know me. Just tell your, just tell them you're you're a friend of me, and they'll get you in. Uh, get some flowers. Make sure. You, Make sure they're really nice. It basically just lays out the entire plan for you and goes, all right, this is the perfect white day. Here's the plan. Go ahead, bro. And I'm just like, that's like the ultimate wingman moment for him. And one of the... I think he's one of the underappreciated characters in this game. He's a he's a character I really grew to love over the course of both of my both of my playthroughs of the game. Um, I don't know, just he was the perfect dad without being a dad to you directly, but he looked after you, he took care of you, he cared about Futaba. And I don't know. Well, it also I really enjoyed laugh. him. With all these Persona games, they never show the parents of the of the main character or, or anybody. It's like, it's like here here's the thing. I have I, is it a Japanese thing where you were arrested, so you're not allowed to live with your parents? And uh, your it's community, your community it's a matter is, of it's a thought of criminality in Japan. Uh, criminality in Japan is taken very seriously. And like the, the, the biggest thing I had here, the only issue I had with the story at all was the whole, was the premise of how it starts and which was like, that is not as a, it given what I've learned about Japanese culture, like you're branded a criminal. You're basic. It's basically semi disownment. Yeah. It's disownment. Like I know, I know a very large aspect is um, they deal with, uh, shame is still a big factor, like bringing yes. shame to yourself, to your, yeah. to your family, to where you're from. Uh, but at the same time, like in part of me is like, well, this wouldn't have gone as far as it did. And it wouldn't have been as severe a punishment as that. If it, like, Oh, you defended yourself against a drunk and you got arrested because the drunks. Well, carries more. Also to note, it's Shido who is, yeah, and yeah, obviously. Strings well, and shit. The, the other, the other thing was the, the big difference in this game to what happens. I don't know in Japan versus the West here is, you know what would happened immediately here when this was happening with the girl, he would have pulled out his phone and been recording what the 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 whole incident. Right. So that's the one difference. I don't know if that's a thing that they don't do or or, or it's something. it's just a it's just a non thing in Japan. Um, yeah, like I, I figured. Just like I, I know it's recording. It's, it's nitpicking for the for the you know for the sake of, but uh, I, I felt that that was the the only part that you could say is a little weak in this was just the how how he gets to where he is at the beginning of the of the game. Yes, of course, corrupt politician. Uh, yes, of course, you know issues with the police, but. The idea that his family, that other people he knew, like he had no friends to stick up for him. He had nothing at school to say that he wasn't a delinquent. Well, given given the fact that we have this idea that he is, uh, that Joker's persona, as it were, is very uh, trickstery. And he's he basic, basically, I would assume, before the events of the game, he's very much the kid in the back of the classroom that does that no one talks to yeah so i i guess yeah that makes sense uh but yeah overall i still i was really impressed with it i'm i'm more psyched now than anything for scramble because i yeah, hear that, that it, it takes place because over scramble the is it it's the summer vacation yeah. right it's yeah, it's a direct sequel and from what i'm hearing it's not a it's not just a direct sequel it's a direct sequel to royal 
Yes. So the story that happens, like, so if you're somebody who hasn't played Royal but played the original, there are aspects you won't get in the new one coming out. I'm also laughing at the fact that Sega, in the Persona Five Royal like survey that they that you can fill out uh, via loading up your PlayStation, there's a survey uh, section when you go into the down into the overview and stuff. Uh, the very last question is, do you want Persona Five Scramble in the West? <laughs> You think? <laughs> that shit in my veins. <laughs> exactly. Alex knows me. I will pre-order today. Well, yeah. yeah like, and they, the talk was, oh, there hasn't been an announcement on the West. Like, I, that's why I contacted Sega a while ago. There hasn't been an announcement for it coming to the West. I'm like, it's coming. Like, this game would have to tank to the point of, like, they would have to sell less than 100,000 copies for this game uh, i believe it's already sold pretty well westward uh i know in japan sold, it didn't it didn't do well at all or, it, it at went under basically. expectations yeah it would not well at all sorry not that it was a failure but they were expecting somewhere in the line of a million copies over there and it sold like three hundred thousand or something yeah it was like three hundred thousand. i think in the west it was close to a million i i and it'll be weird to see how this how this whole coronavirus stuff plays out with it too because other than Persona, it's Final Fantasy VII because let's be honest, like Doom is going to sell to its to its core audience. Uh, you've got uh, like other than Resident and, Evil Three. Resident Evil Three, it's not selling the way it, <laughs> they wanted it to. It's too short. You've got basically Persona, Animal Crossing, and Final Fantasy are going to be the big sellers for the next two or three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Persona Five Royal came in at number seven for March MPDs, which is uh, UK, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, no, MPDs is US. Okay. Uh, yeah, MPDs well, it, is US, and, that, and that's for March. It came out the last day of March. Yes, number seven. So in one day, in it sold. It was number seven in, in that. So I imagine it beat out Grand. It beat out GTA Five. Uh, Borderlands 3 and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. So basically, if you look at. And just under we, Doom Eternal. And so basically, if we look at April, is where we're going to see. In April, it's going to be Final Fantasy in that. Because uh, Animal Crossing came up before. And that. And, and for the record, no, the Royal came, Sales. Yeah. Came, yeah Animal Crossing came from, out. Yeah. Animal Crossing came out, out the week before. It, it was the Friday before Royal came out. The twenty third, yeah, yeah, and also yeah, for the record, Royal sales through MPD are counting the digital. Okay, so I'm I would be willing to predict if it's that placement, it's probably about a million copies. Which yeah, somewhere for for uh, Persona, like didn't Persona Five the original do a couple million in the U.S. and Canada? Uh, I forget what the cat. I forget because it's a PlayStation hit. Uh, I forget what yeah, minimum the, one million. It's minimum one million. Yeah. So at the very least, it made it sold a million copies because so it's a PlayStation. I hit. know they they said Persona Four was a surprise hit on the PS2 because it was like right at the end of its life, uh, and Golden uh, actually moved Vita's. But I believe wasn't Persona Five the highest selling Atlas yes. game of all time? The highest selling Atlas game of all time in the West. Correct. So I'm. This would probably be on par. I feel like. Now here's a question: Do you think this game, like, what would have happened had this been the version that came out initially? I think it would still get a lot of praise, but I almost feel like people are complaining, saying, "Oh, you know, this should have been the version from the start." Well, I feel like how good the original version was helped bring hype to this version. Exactly. So one hundred percent. I. I I don't know. Like, if you combine the sales of, of the first version and this one together, I don't know if this game would have sold as well as both of them combined if it was the only version. Yeah. No. So, I, it, 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 I feel like I don't mind if they do this, especially when it's not like the biggest mistake you have is you have a company release a game and then, like, within a year, they're like, here's the game of the year edition. It's like, no, I'm not paying full price again. This, is a th- this was three years between. Or just under it three, was years, three years. years. It was two and a half for the U.S., three years for yeah. Japan. So about so about three years between, and then you have 
a completely re, uh, renewed script, uh, which remember when I showed you the, how much better the English wow. dub is compared to the Japanese dub? Wow. And the Japanese dub has been remixed too. But it it's the Japanese dub is like amateur hour compared. It's still a good dub for what it is. But the the uh, Atlas uh, US localization team should be given some sort of award because they they put things in the background they need to be in the background they layered the audio better than almost any game i've ever played ever and they brought things to the forefront they need to be brought forward the even the localization of like the cut scenes are a million times better than the japanese counterparts and that's not you know some i think that might also have to be a point of a lot of japanese gamers they're not playing with surround sound well even with headphones though like surround sound is one big i'm a big surround sound fan which is cool so yeah. generally the western surround sound up better but then again final fantasy has fantastic surround sound so but square has always been at the forefront of audio Square's tech. always pushing tech specifically yeah, audio squares tech. Tech. Yeah. um but but as far as with headphones on i was like i would flip between the japanese and the english and i'm like and i'm not you know, a dub snob or, or a sub snob or whatever. But I feel like if you sat down somebody who is, you know, a purist, I must play it in Japanese, played that and then played the English version, they would have to lie to you to tell you that the Japanese version was better. This is one of the yeah. few times where it, like, it's hands down night and day. Uh, specifically when I presented the Kasumi dance sequence from, uh, from the cool festival. Michael, I don't know if you saw the difference, but it, it was dramatic when you it, when you brutal. watch it she's when she's dancing on the floor you hear her like sweeping her feet against the ground her hair all the, and all the sound effects are in the forefront yeah, yeah like like yeah like, like it, it, it was really something else like the, like yeah. the the animation was fantastic to begin with but, but, but i mean michael you saw how good it is you should watch yeah. it in japanese to see how bad that version is um oh it's it, bad it's like, bad you can hear like like when she like flicks the sweat off it's like a hose like it like it, it oh. the, the the foley effects are bad uh in the american version they basically buried what they needed to bury removed sound effects that would take away from the effect of the entire scene they this might be one of the best localization jobs pure localization jobs where they don't remove Japanese aspects for the sake of removing Japanese aspects, but it's almost like they should hire the American team to work on the, on the Japanese version too, because whoever is the audio engineer there is fantastic. Yeah, like they really outdid themselves for this, and everybody who re recorded lines of dialogue was amazing. Like certain actress, actors and actresses did amazing jobs like i said i am yeah. surprised by how much emotion came through um and like one I, of my think, favorite sorry, sorry go ahead. i was gonna say i'm pretty sure some people said that, that on was not as good in the original version as well as a few yeah. others the other yeah thing she's very flat graphics wise the game is not just bigger because they added more content uh it like i was playing it on the ps4 pro they uh up the textures like it, it's, it's oh, yeah. larger more detailed textures as well as um, higher poly counts on everything so the game goes from being i think 20 gigs to like 45 or something like that uh and even though they increase the size the game loads faster runs smoother uh the mechanic of adding the uh the grappling hook changes how you traverse things and it's not like the initial preview and reviewer said where it's like oh they just tacked on one scene here and there no they've changed the layout of all the palaces that so that you're required to use it to navigate yeah. So there's those aspects that were changed. Uh, and then, sorry, yeah, you go back to what you're saying, Michael. I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that there are graphical upgrades too. But so, yeah, one of the things that I really wanted to highlight was just some of the new emotion and inflections. Like you mentioned, on sounded kind of flat in the original. Here, she's got a lot more kind of nuance and fun to her voice, especially when she sounds annoyed with you or when she's flirty so that i don't know there's just something about her i really liked although um futaba's voice actress i got a lot out of especially when she's really doing the emotional less kind of like 
meme lord stuff when she's actually having a serious conversation with you. I think the actress's name is Erica Lindbeck, I think her name is. Um, just gorgeous uh, performance there. I don't know who did uh, Kasumi Sumiri, um, but that was fantastic as well. Like, there's not one person in the localization that didn't fit um a catchy um again when he gives when he when he's in his loki persona at in the last part of the game that was brutal it was awesome it was honest one of the things i didn't get a chance to mention a couple minutes ago is that that fatalism he knows when Maruki's world goes away, he dies. I like how through his performance, he doesn't care. He knows this. This is his world. And you get that from his performance. He knows if he's going out, it's going to be on his terms and he's okay with it. Um, yeah. Like there's just something so powerful about that. This is probably one of my favorite vocal performances in a very long time. Like voice acting to me sticks out in games, but the Persona 5 Royal voice cast raises it up to another level. I mean, before this, my favorite voice acting cast was the Mass Effect series. This is above that for me. We're at a point now where, I can say this well, you know, Square Enix pushes the tech. They'll push CG farther. They'll push uh, uh, they'll push audio tech farther than anybody. One thing I'll give compared to Final Fantasy VII, for example, is Final Fantasy VII probably cost in the realm of six to ten times what it costs to make Persona. Yet Persona yeah. feels more fluid. The dialogue feels more natural. Uh, there's less awkward moments where they have a good cast obviously with, with the square, square hires for everybody, but they're always forced to deliver stilted dialogue in almost everything they have. It's almost like they don't have, you know, they obviously don't have like a Western speaker as the person in mind to uh, develop the flow and the nuance of how they move. But even with slightly less uh, like facial expressions and, and micro expressions that you'll get in a, a, a persona style game, you get that from the performance of the voice actors. So whoever is doing voice direction as well as script writing, I feel that that Sega Atlas has now hit pinnacle levels above pretty much every Western or Eastern uh, studio out there now. You know, they surpassed the square. Which makes which makes me even more excited for SMT5. Yeah. Well, the, the thing, the, the weirdest thing for me is like, I never thought I'd say this like, like you, Michael, they have surpassed the Bioware team as far as how they script their dialogue. Yeah, it's it's something it's really something else. And and as much as I love Jennifer Hale and Mark Mir as Commander Shepard, there's just something about the performances I got from these characters that I felt like I love Jennifer Hale's goodbye to her romance. Most often in my playthroughs, it's Garrus um at the end of Mass Effect 3's extended cut and just some of the scenes that they share together. And you really do get some powerful performances there. But with this one, everybody has their moment to shine. Like even the goofy rebel Ryuji has his own moments. When you do Yusuke's confidant and he talks about finding the true inspiration to paint and to find his own path again, there's, there's there and even haru who i hated in persona 5 i oh. like her now yeah like, she and, she got so much more to do in persona 5 well, and, and, yeah when you see part of the thing is in the new game or not new game plus but in like the new parts of the game you get to see what their ideal wor worlds would be and it, it some of them are are like you know simple like mona's is i want to be human big deal but then you start to see people that are dead, that are living happy lives, and or people that were abusive parents that are now like loving parents. And you're like, do you really want to shatter that dream? And yeah. that's something that I want to talk about as we begin to 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 close this out. All of us got the true ending. Um, one of the things that I did as part of the research for this episode, I decided to watch the bad ending on YouTube, and. I, 
for a second, for just a minute, I wondered, did I make the right choice? And I say that as I started this episode out, pain and experience helps define you. It's how you move forward and through it that makes you a better person, to makes you ready to take on the world as whatever it takes. But seeing your hopes and dreams come through to be truly be happy when, when the game ends, you see them all gathered at the front of Su- of of Shujin Academy. Futaba is going to be says, hey, I'm going to be starting here in April. And you see uh, Makoto and Haru, they're graduating. And the on's like, man, it sucks. You guys aren't going to be here next year. And Futaba's like, hey, and Sojiro is going to teach me how to cook. I'll bring you guys lunch every day. And everyone's super happy. And then um, Akechi shows up, says, hey, guys, why don't we all take um, a, a a picture together? Then Maruki in a hat comes by and he's like, Hey guys, I see your friends. Can I take your picture for all you so you can all be together? And they're like, yeah, sure. Thank you. Kind stranger. And he takes the picture (laughs) of you and you're all happy and smiling, even Joker. And then as the game's credits roll, it shows pictures of everybody living their dreams out. You see Haru opening a new big bang burger, standing beside her brother, beside her father, which, which is nice, but they don't, but then you're brought to reality of, well, they'll never grow as people. Yeah, although you even wonder, do you accept it? Because at one point, as the credits roll, there's a picture of you playing chess with Akechi. And then the game just oh. ends. So See, it's like, wow. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I just have to say one thing that I think is on all of our minds, and uh, that is shut up, Ryuji. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm Shut glad up. I'm glad they added more to that aspect in Royal because that was there were two quotes that I was saying don't tell me to go to sleep Mona and shut up Ryuji. That was in my original playthrough. Uh, those were the two comments that I would say over and over again. Yeah, because that guy just doesn't know when to shut up about the well, Phantom. He was like, dude, shut up. We're in public. And, and it was like the little details. I learned more about different coffee beans from around the world than I ever expected to ever learn from a video game. <laughs> um, I have tr- so when the game originally came out, I tried Japanese curry, which was really good. And just before I started my uh, liquid diet uh, back in January, I had my wife make me Sojiro's. Um, Persona 5 curry. And then, and then I found out Atlas released the official recipe for Persona 5. So thanks for doing that when I'm in the middle of a weight loss program. You <laughs> but, dick but bags. Remember, because it is, Jeff, once your weight loss stuff is done and you've got surgery and you're back to eating. Oh, know, I'm coming back. You're back to eating normal foods. Once you're doing that, that is a healthy meal. So, you know, small portions. It is, you know, there's very few purely Japanese recipes that are going to be extremely bad for you, right? Yeah. It's like all deep fried. So like one of the things that kind of hit me about the ending, sorry, just to jump back to that for just a moment is when you see all these people living out their lives happy. I don't know. I said for just a moment, it gives you pause. And if that's considered the bad ending, I like how a game like this yeah. makes you think. Very there philosophical. Been... Very, very mm-hmm. introspective. Um, they've done it before in previous games, but this might be the most so, at least for a Japanese game. There are going to be games that are con- entirely focused on this sort of topic, but I was not expecting it from a JRPG that is basically uh, a high school dating simulator with demons. Yeah, like when I first played persona, that's how you pitched it to me. It was, it's a high school dating simulator, but you fight monsters. I was like, okay, I've always wanted to try those dating sim games because they seem fun. I've always been pretty lucky in love. So it's fun to experiment now that I'm married, you know, it's a fantasy thing. But with this, I was experiencing real emotion and it was fun. It was fantastic. And it brought back so many memories and it made me, pose ethical questions to myself like given the choice what would i do and i would like to think i would choose jokers and akechi's choice of you are not letting reality be what you determine we will fight back against that but not everybody might i choose basically it is i choose the right to choose 
Yeah, exactly. I choose me, not you. And I love that sense of de- de- determination in the face of danger, in the face of inscrutable danger, you choose individualism. And I think that's a very powerful message for you to stand up for yourself. It's a very powerful message to not be, not let yourself be defined by others. It's, I don't know, it's something I think more young people could perhaps benefit from. Absolutely. And, and, and it is a game where you can go off the beaten path and just experience little slices of life. And you can, you can do the whole experience a different culture deal. Uh, like, make sure you do things that aren't just the main storyline in this game, you know, discover that there's a, a bathroom on the, on the main floor of, uh, Sujiro's, uh, cafe that you can use to clean the bar, which I had no idea was there until I was looking for trophies. Uh, or you know what? The other one that you can easily miss. And a lot of people do is, you know, go to the, the, um, the bathhouse in the summer when it's raining out and you'll experience one of the funniest scenes I've seen in the game. I was on the floor ra- laughing at that. Um, there's another thing with the philosophical question. The final semester, did you guys notice what the fan site question was? No, I don't remember. Would you join the Phantom Thieves? Oh. Yeah. And that that's just a great way to kind of cap that cap all those questions about the phantom thieves would you join the phantom thieves yeah th- this and, is honestly uh, if you were looking for somebody who you know has not had a lot of experience with jrpgs they maybe there's somebody now who's playing final fantasy 7 remake because they've heard all the hype and they're, they're like that's cool but if you want something that is the purest evolution of the traditional jrpg that is accessible to all gets you get not only do you get your money's worth from time spent but from the experience that you'll feel emotionally and intellectually with it while you guys are all in your homes so you have no excuse this is like it's like you know don't show somebody a a, you know very esoteric hardcore rpg that is like i gotta grind for 700 hours this is probably one of the best if not the best entry point i can say for somebody who's never played an rpg who is like i have time what is a game that i could play that you know could ease me in you play this on the stupid easy mode and uh you can i can guarantee pretty much anybody can play this from any age group as long as you can read yeah yep. absolutely so i guess that's pretty much going to do it for this edition of the prototype i guess our final recommendation is by persona 5 royal you are not going to regret it it's a fantastic experience that will take you at least 120 hours, though Alex got through it significantly quicker. If you speed read and, and skip through some of the dialogue because you're reading it instead of listening and, and, and reading it regular speed, it'll cu- take you about 75 to 80 hours. But uh, it is time well spent, and uh, we wholly, we wholeheartedly recommend it. So, Ken, thank you for joining us. We definitely appreciate your uh, insights with us here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Hope I'm return (laughs) absolutely so ken if if uh, people wanted to follow your other podcast projects where would they have to go uh you can follow me on twitter at ken reels uh uh my two different podcasts uh one is my anime podcast this anime and that can be found at at this anime pod on twitter this anime podcast.com and my movie podcast, which is on hiatus because there's no theatrical films out because quarantine. Uh, that is movie nation, movie nation.com. Uh, I am planning on doing something next month. Hopefully um, it, I'm basically going to go through my uh, giant movie collection and pick out some of the, what are considered classics uh according to studios and kind of just go is this really a classic or is this just kind of one of those eh i can forget it that'll be interesting all right so uh, as so as always you can find me and alex right here on uh on our socials at this week in geek me or alex will respond though most often alex says he controls the twitter or you can always email us feedback at this week in geek.net we look forward to hearing from you so guys until next time we have been 
Who are you going with, Michael? Remember how we talked about this? You have to. It'll be you. Be it'll, it'll be you because you're the co-host with you. Alex, the producer, okay. <laughs> and uh, Ken Lutz. And I've been Mike the Birdman Dodd. Normally, I'd say my normal sign off here, but because this is the prototype, I'm not doing that. So I'll quote my friend Jackie Bam Bam, simply saying, "Be cool, be kind, be careful." We we'll catch you guys again next time, right here on ThisWeekInGeek.net. Shut up, Ryuji. Thank you.